the last carbon-based resources should be extracted in the poorest countries so that they get the revenues. And instead, we're in danger of using our political and economic power over the poorest countries to make them close their, their carbon-based energy first. And that, to my mind, would be just shameful. You are listening to In Pursuit of Development with Dan Bannock. Welcome to season three of the show. I am absolutely thrilled to be back after a three month break and announce that we have an exciting season ahead with brilliant guests lined up for you. My first guest this season is none other than Sir Paul Collier from the University of Oxford. Paul has written several path-breaking books, including the bestseller, The Bottom Billion, Why the Poorest Countries Are Failing and What Can Be Done About It. In this conversation, we spoke about the development traps that Paul identified in The Bottom Billion, first published in 2007, whether and how the bottom billion countries have benefited from globalization, the extent to which democracy fosters development, why mainstream economics has largely ignored the concept of sustainable development, and the arguments for economic growth and degrowth. I hope you enjoyed this conversation and thank you for being such a loyal listener. I'm a huge fan of your work, Paul. Welcome to the show. Well, thanks for inviting me. It's uh... It's a good chance to, to reach so many people. It's very impressive what you've built. Let's begin with uh, The Bottom Billion, one of my favorite books. And by the way, I have almost all of your books. They're taking too much space on my bookshelves these days. But in, in Bottom Billion and in many other books, Paul, you've argued that development can be viewed as shoots and ladders and that Many countries are using these ladders, especially, in, let's say, in Asia to improve societal well-being, and some are stuck. They can't climb these ladders. And you identified four sort of traps in this famous book of yours, and you have many famous books, of course. In the bottom billion, you talk about the conflict trap, the natural resources trap, the trap of being landlocked with bad neighbors, and the trap of bad governance in a small country. Before we actually go on to discuss some of these traps, Paul, now in hindsight, almost a decade and a half since that book, The Bottom Billion, was first published, what, according to you, has actually changed? Have some of these 58 countries that you then identified as part of The Bottom Billion, have some of these countries, in your view, successfully come out of one or more of these traps? Yes, a few of them. It's, it's indeed something I'm, I'm working on. And, and some have, unfortunately, not that many. And things were disguised for a while because the, the decade from about 2003 to 13 was a very, very benign decade for a lot of poor countries because there was a, a natural resource boom so powerful, it was called the super cycle. And a lot of poor countries were already natural resource exporters. And a lot, of more, a lot more of them became natural resource exporters. And that provided a sort of pulse of income, which in the short term raised growth rates. But of course, you know, one of the traps in the, the bottom billion is indeed the natural resource trap. And some of them stumbled into that trap. So it's very much a two-edged sword discovering natural resources. If we want an example of that at the moment, it's, it's Mozambique, where um, they discovered 
uh, offshore gas, and you'd have thought that offshore gas wouldn't be very problematic, but it was off the coast of a poor and remote region. And that has, has now created very, very serious conflict, uh, which the government is unable to contain. And, and indeed, today's news is that uh, Rwanda has just sent a, a thousand troops in. Rwanda is one, one of the countries that has succeeded in emerging from, from the bottom billion. It's a very impressive story. Uh, so a few have escaped. That decade, the benign decade, flattered the situation. So it, for a while, it looked a lot better than it really is. I'm particularly interested in hearing your views on globalization. I've had several guests on my show. I've spoken to Branko Milanovic, Martin Sanbu from the Financial Times. Many others have new books on globalization. And 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 the general consensus seems to be that it has benefited a lot of countries, mainly in Asia. But my question to you is how and to what extent do you think that has benefited or globalization has benefited some of these bottom billion countries? Because you know, there's been, on the one hand, countries like, say, Vietnam or Bangladesh or India, China are doing well, but that kind of success has also generated quite considerable dissatisfaction in the West, something that you are, that you write about in, in your more recent books. You have cutbacks in aid, all of that. But in terms of Africa, the African continent and most of these countries in the bottom billion countries, what has globalization given them? Yeah, it's a mixed bag. I'll, I'll give you one example of what I think is really quite damaging, and that is the brain drain. If we, I'll do a, a practical example. One of the most successful countries in Africa is Ghana, with a pretty competent and decent democratically elected government, one re-election in a, a properly contested and verified election. So there's no question that it's uh, you know, sort of ticks the boxes of democracy. And the government is clearly trying to provide a lot of benefits for, for the mass of the population. I know the government quite well, and I'm, I'm impressed with it. But if we take something very practical, like health, Ghana has to train two doctors for every one that it's able to retain. And why is that? Where do the other half of the Ghanaian doctors go? Well, overwhelmingly, they go to Britain. And why do they go to Britain? Because Britain has, I think, abused globalization dreadfully in the case of its health service. So Britain has 18 of the top 100 universities in the world, which is an amazing number of top, top 100 universities. No other country has anything like that number of top universities relative to its population. Africa hasn't got a single university in the top 100, right? So where is it sensible to train doctors? Is it sensible to, to train doctors in British universities, obviously, right? Instead, because training doctors is expensive, well, the British Health Service has been run by recruiting more than half its doctors from Africa and South Asia. And so there's been a deliberate policy of not using Britain's brilliant universities to train our doc the doctors we need. Right? Less than half of our doctors are trained by British universities. The same applies to nurses from Malawi. Absolutely, absolutely. This is just a, an ethical disgrace. And where do we get them? We get them from Ghana. Now, it's absolutely obvious that a doctor would be a more benefit to mankind in Ghana than in Britain. Ghana's far more short of doctors than Britain. When we move to a really poor country like Sudan, there are more Sudanese doctors in London than in the whole of the Sudan. Now, this seems to me a completely indefensible abuse of globalization. So we brag about giving aid, but actually we're plundering the most important resource that Africa's got, which is its trained manpower. And uh, Africa is very short of trained people, and precisely because it's got a very weak university system. And so that sort of globalization has been, to my mind, an ethical disgrace. 
But Paul, another side of the story, and I've spoken to some of these Malawian nurses who work in the UK and many others who've emigrated. Some of these immigrants would say, you know, we also have to think about ourselves, not just our country. You know, we're not really getting the benefits. We're not really getting the incomes. And it is actually far better for us to be uh, working in another country and send this money back home. That is better for the country than us being here, being demotivated and underpaid. Well, let's, let's, let's unpack that a bit. First of all, the evidence on remittances. The, the, the average migrant only sends about $1,000 a year back. So that's less than $3 a day. It's not very much. Right? Those people would be much more productive in the country than $3 a day. Now, it's true they wouldn't earn as much working in Africa as they do working in Britain. Of course not. They would work, earn a lot relative to other people in their society. Relative to living standards in Ghana, doctors are well paid. And so, of course, as you described, there's a clear tension. Individuals are being tempted to, to say, well, yeah, it's true, my own society educated me. They, they paid for my education. And I was, I was one of the very few lucky people that got a good university education in, in, in Ghana, and I'm now a qualified doctor. So there's a tension that's been created by British recruitment policy. Now, where's the ethical fault there? I think it's unreasonable to expect a doctor trained in Ghana to say, well, I will sacrifice myself, my own interest, for the interest of my society. But I do think it's important for Britain not to tempt people, right? One of the you know, sort of one of the Christian precepts is thou shalt not tempt. And deliberately having a policy where you only train less than half the doctors you need each year and get them cheap from pre-trained doctors in Africa, that seems to me deeply unethical. And the moral fault is not with the individuals who move, it's with the governments that run policy in such a way that they're not providing enough trained people. And Britain should be training a lot of African doctors to go back to Africa. Far from that, it's not even training enough of its own doctors to work in Britain. The politics of Great Britain of late, of course, has been um, hotly <laughs> debated and contested. It's not just Brexit, but also uh, cut cutbacks in aid and uh, the, the image of global Britain taking a beating. And yeah, look, I'm not against globalization, but I think let's recognize that it's actually several different things. It's capital movements. And there we've got the tragic situation that far too little money is, is heading into Africa, far too, too little money. And so capital movements have not been working at all well for Africa. So capital is globalized, but it's working in the wrong way. Whenever there's a global financial panic, people move their money into the safe haven of America, even when it's America that's caused the problem. So capital movements are globalized, but they're not working well for Africa. As I've just described you, human capital movements, the trained labor force, is globalized, but it's not working well for Africa. So what about Rwanda, Paul? You mentioned that as a successful yeah. country. Now you have, you know, many would say, of course, a non-democratic country, but charismatic, visionary leadership from Paul Kagame. He's able to attract the Starbucks to Rwanda, Rwandan coffees being sold, you know, everywhere. So there's this kind of a positive narrative about Rwanda. Is, is that helping the country get the capital or is it still struggling? Oh, it, it is helping the country get the, capital, get the capital. Most spectacularly, yesterday, Rwanda was able to launch a, a, the largest bond issue that it's ever launched on global markets. It was $620 million, which it was able to borrow at an interest rate of uh, just over 5%. Now, that's not bad. That's not bad. That is capital movements working well for once, because the government of, of Rwanda has now got some money, and as long as it can use that money 
on investments that pay more than 5% a year, which it very likely can, because there's so many opportunities to improve the economic infrastructure in Rwanda. So that's uh, capital working well, but it's a relatively rare case. Rwanda is, is obviously not a, 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 f- a full democracy. It's, um, uh, it's what, but it is, I think, what my colleague Tim Besley calls a common interest state. By that, Tim means there are two possible ways in which a state can be, can be run for the common interest of its citizens. One is if it's a properly functioning democracy. And by properly functioning, that's quite a demanding task. It means that ordinary people are getting a government which delivers on their anxieties and their concerns and their hopes. And a lot of countries that look to be democratic actually turned out not to be doing that. Yes, and and this is something that you address in several books, in addition to identifying this trap of bad governance in a small country in the bottom billion. Paul, there's been considerable talk of the importance of democracy, good governance, and the global development discourse. And and you have consistently argued that democracy is not enough, that democracy is without proper restraints. That is a problem, that even replacing autocracy with democracy may not be enough, that there are just so few incentives, you believe, in democratic transitions to build these restraints. So have your views evolved over the years or do you still believe that? No, I still believe that, but I've got... I've, I've sort of added to them mm-hmm. because I think what really matters is the is not just the sort of political checks and balances. It's very important what ideas are circulating in the society. So my more recent work has been on how ideas change in a society, how they spread through social networks. And ideas do change, but they take quite a lot of time. I mean, if we look at, um, we flip for a moment from Rwanda to Afghanistan, quite clearly the the underlying problem in Afghanistan is not the mechanics of democracy, it's the ideas in people's heads. A lot of the population has got Islamic fundamentalist ideas, which have enabled this organization, the Taliban, to take root, and people are willing to fight and die for those ideas. And so it's unreal to try and get democracies established in social contexts in which the ideas of a lot of the people in the society are really completely antipathetic towards democracy. And so there's a, there's a, a, a slower process of, of the evolution of ideas in society. And that can't be done very well by foreigners. It, these are the, the shift in ideas is really a domestic struggle internal to a society. And in Afghanistan, it was a very unrealistic approach was taken to shifting ideas. I mean, let me give you one practical example, which was, of course, in the West, we believe passionately in gender equality. One of the ministers in Afghanistan told me that every foreign government that came to visit him had told him of the importance of gender equality, and 20 of the visiting governments had said, to help you in this task of gender equality, I'm going to leave you an advisor on gender equality. (laughs) And so literally, he had 20 foreign advisors on gender equality. He he was consulting me because he said, what, what, what can I do with, with, with this? Right. I actually knew the German woman who, who'd, who'd, been, who'd, who'd been posted there for a couple of years. Obviously, I'm as keen on gender equality as, 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 as anybody else. But the idea that, that Afghanistan's ideas on gender equality could be changed within a few years by uh, foreign advisors was clearly ridiculous dangerously ridiculous. Now we're confronted by the prospect of a complete collapse of government in Afghanistan. 
And if that happens, gender equality will collapse for a long time. And so this was a case where you know, this sort of preachy sense of moral superiority in the West, I think, was very damaging. It created an unreal approach, whereas the real priority in Afghanistan was to build the basic sinews of the state. And the basic sinews of the state were a capacity to tax and a capacity to provide security for citizens. And neither of those really happened. Uh, Afghanistan became hugely dependent on foreign aid, and it became hugely dependent on foreign troops. And the foreign governments have got fed up of providing the foreign troops, and they're suddenly leaving, and that has produced a collapse. But, you know, for, for nearly 20 years we've been in Afghanistan, and we've left no sustainable legacy, because we didn't build the sinews of the state, we provided moral preachiness like 20 gender advisors, you know. I've had numerous discussions with Ashraf Ghani before he became president. And I suppose many countries in the world have placed perhaps too much faith in leadership, you know, thinking that there will be a savior and hoping for the best. But, but that has not happened. And it's shocking what has happened a couple of days ago in Kandahar. There was this comedian who was slaughtered by the Taliban. And, and it is absolute chaos, as you were saying. Let's move on to a trap that you've identified, that of being landlocked with bad neighbors. And, you know, coming back to the African continent, there are huge transport costs for many African countries. In 2006, seven, you identified almost 40% of the population in the bottom billion countries living in landlocked countries. We're talking about Ugandas and the Malawis and the Central African republics. But some countries, like, say, Botswana, which is also landlocked, have fared a bit better than others. What explains that relative success? Well, of course, Botswana, is, uh, its, its export good is, is diamonds. Mm-hmm. And diamonds are so light that transport costs are irrelevant. Diamonds are the classic example of something that's immensely valuable relative to its weight. So transport costs for diamonds really don't matter. So Botswana was able to develop its diamond sector without any worries. I, if I were writing The Bottom Billion again, I would, I would change the, the chapter on the landlocked because I underestimated the growth of air freight and, and cheap air travel. And there are Two countries, both landlocked, which have really, really used air links very well. And one is indeed Rwanda. Yes. Um, and what Rwanda did, it realized if, if you're going to be landlocked, and it's deeply landlocked, you better, be, better not be airlocked. And so they, they created a new airline, Air Rwanda. They made sure it was a very efficient airline, which it is, I've flown it. And they made it a region, they turned Kigali into a regional hub with actually competitive airline services. So it's not just Air Rwanda. There were several companies flying between the neighboring capitals, Dar es Salaam, Nairobi, and Kampala. You can fly from these regional capitals to Rwanda using competitive services. And so Rwanda has become a local hub, but it's also become a hub for tourists. And this was a brilliant thing. I mean, imagine, 20, you, know, you go back to 1994, less than 30 years ago, and what did people identify with Rwanda? Genocide. Okay? Genocide and the collapse into total violence. So that was the image 29 years ago. And through a very clever strategy, Rwanda decided to target the world tourist industry. Now, Rwanda doesn't have beaches, didn't even have that many animals. But they, first of all, with animals, they realized if animals can walk out of Rwanda, they can walk back in or be flown back in. So Rwanda attracted the animals and created game parks. 
brilliant, brilliant strategy. It then realized that a lot of tourism is actually piggybacked off, off conferences. And so it built a world-class conference center. And then it created a very good hotel industry. It also made sure that Kigali is a clean and safe city. I've walked across Kigali at midnight on my own and felt completely safe, something I wouldn't do in London. And the cleanest in the world. Absolutely. So it's a very, very fine city. I, 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 I'm rather proud of my contribution to Kigali because a few years ago, President Kagami, who'd read my work on urbanization, made me the chair of a new advisory committee on Kigali. And so I chair a committee where the rest of the people on the committee are architects from around the world. And we're all advising the mayor of Kigali on how to make um, Kigali. Our instructions were, don't let Kigali become the mess that the other East African capital cities are. And indeed, Kigali is still looking really very good. We were just promoted just on the eve of COVID so that we are told uh, now we're, we're an advisory committee for all the urbanization in Rwanda because they're very concerned that they don't want to get the usual primate city problem where the only city that matters is the capital city. They want cities around Rwanda to be offering uh, opportunities for people. Very sensible. Paul, I mean, I just have to ask you this because this is a debate that I'm often involved in in terms of Rwanda. Every time one praises Rwanda, there's an equal amount of criticism about the country being undemocratic. And so maybe it is sometimes uncomfortable to talk about the fact that non-democratic governments can maybe also have good policies. Yeah, there are, there are two points here. One, one is, and this is the, the concept of common interest states, which Tim Besley has developed. Right? Tim Besley, probably one of the most distinguished academic economists in the world. And the concept of common interest, Tim says, well, actually, democracy is pretty irrelevant to, to, to common interests. Some democratic states manage to do common interest. Common interest means the government is broadly aligned with the interest of ordinary people, of the mass of the population. But you can equally get to common interest through a non-democratic system, as long as the elite running the country finds that its basic interest in how to run the state is pretty closely aligned with the interest of ordinary people. And that was the achievement of Kagame, was to win the fight within the ruling party he won it three or four years after they came to power in 1994. There was a dispute within the political party as to whether the Tutsi who'd won power militarily should use it for their own benefit or whether they should use it for the interest of the whole of society. And Kagame led the faction which said, if we just run Rwanda for the Tutsi, our children will all get slaughtered again. And so, so he said, we've no choice but to run Rwanda in the interest of the mass of the population. And that's what he's tried to do. And he's done pretty well. So just to finish the story on trying to become a tourist destination, they then spent a lot of money advertising. I took my kid to watch a football match at Arsenal. And all around the stadium, and all around on the players' T-shirts, it said, come to Rwanda. And that was much criticized by the British NGO community. They want Rwanda to spend all its money on, you know, putting a smile on a child's face sort of stuff. But actually, getting mass tourism and advertising worked. By 2019, Rwanda was the second most visited country in the whole of Africa the second most visited country in the whole of Africa, only beaten by South Africa. It was an amazing achievement for a small landlocked country to become so popular as a, as a destination for foreigners to go. So that was a staggering achievement achieved through a very integrated strategy, the conference center, the, the nature reserves, uh, wildlife parks, and the uh, advertising and the focus on hotels and a clean 
safe city. So it was a very clever strategy in a very highly constrained situation. So Rwanda is a common interest state. It's not a democracy, but it is benefiting the large mass of the population. So that, to my mind, is, is good enough for the moment. And the larger point is that instant, instantly becoming Denmark, or Norway for that matter, just isn't on the menu of feasible. Denmark, and I use Denmark because it's an example of a, of a country without natural resources, which is right up there with Norway in terms of living standards and uh, human satisfaction. Denmark did not become Denmark instantly. I mean, it didn't become modern Denmark instantly. It got there through a very long process of struggle where the first thing that happened was you, th that Denmark developed an effective state. It developed an effective military that could provide security and an effective tax system. Uh, and so it then moved towards a more democratic society, but it was a long internal struggle. Denmark didn't become modern Denmark thanks to preaching from the University of Michigan. And the same will be true of Rwanda. This reminds me of my friend Francis Fukuyama's uh, point about getting to Denmark, about certain institutions, certain processes taking place. You can't just have a country moving or making that transition very quickly. But just staying on this point, this trap, the landlocked trap, Paul, I remember reading two very interesting points in, in The Bottom Billion about, and you write that, if you're a coastal country, you serve the world. If you're landlocked, you serve your neighbors. So that was one. And related to this is, just as living in a good neighborhood matters for all of us, you, me, you know, most people in the world, a good, nice neighborhood is also important at the national level. So geography matters in terms of having countries, you know, neighboring countries whose economies are growing at a fast pace. Maybe that could also benefit a landlocked country. Now, in a recent study I did with my colleagues in Malawi, we were actually looking at Malawi's dependence on Mozambique. Now, it turns out Malawi, of course, uses four so-called transport corridors to access the ports, and three of these pass through Mozambique. And a few years ago, the then president, Bingu Mutarika, came up with this very ambitious plan to construct the so-called Shire Zambezi Waterway. And the purpose of this ambitious project was to provide Malawi with access to the Indian Ocean through this city called Chinde in Mozambique. To cut a long story short, the project spectacularly failed. One of the reasons was the kind of unilateral actions by Malawi's president. We use the term megaphone diplomacy. You know, he went about planning and implementing this project without really consulting Mozambique and his counterparts there. And another reason was that there was total lack of interest in Mozambique to actually sacrifice their land-based transport corridors in, in, in terms of this new waterway project. So my point about all of this, and I'd like to hear your views, is that anytime a country like Malawi that is landlocked is trying to address the challenge of being landlocked, and of course you're right about air freight, that, that is important, even though I still believe it is pretty expensive still to fly within the African continent. Every time a Malawi is trying to explore these new options, it is very much hindered by its lack of maybe proper diplomatic consultations, but most importantly, when the neighboring country, in this case, Mozambique, when Mozambique isn't interested, Malawi's stuck. Absolutely. And absolutely. And the same is true, incidentally, with the railway connection. I mean, I, I work on Malawi too, but if, if, uh, if we take air travel to Malawi, it's very, very uncompetitive because it's a small market. And so, Basically, there's a monopoly by South African Airways. And that route from Joburg to Malawi per kilometer flown is the most expensive route in the whole of South African Airways network. In other words, it's exploiting its monopoly mercilessly against a very poor little landlocked country. If we look at other situations where you've got your landlocked with bad neighbors, at the moment, most obviously to Niger in the Sahel. 
you just look at the neighbors and you say, that's a problem. And so, and the, it's a very fundamental problem of insecurity. The, uh, the new president of Niger has just appealed for help on the security situation. He says, what I most need is aircraft and satellite technology. I need to know where the, where the, 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 the jihadi forces are lurking in this huge country, which is twice the size of France. And of course, Niger is one of the poorest countries in the world. And so it just doesn't have the money to provide the, that famous phrase, a monopoly of security over its territory. But just to, just to finish the story on air freight, and where, where I was wrong in the bottom billion, is the example of Ethiopia. Yes. Ethiopia really has managed to break into light manufacturing by making Addis an air hub which could fly in cheap inputs and then fly in, fly out the production that used those inputs. And the, uh, the starting point was, uh, was the production of, um, of, of footwear, of trainers. And, uh, and that, that began in 2011 with a Chinese company relocating to Addis. And it was a very close run thing because it, being the first footwear company in, in Ethiopia, there was no cluster scale economies. It was the only firm there. So its labor costs fell massively. In coastal China, where it moved from, it was paying $500 a month wage. In Ethiopia, people were perfectly willing to get $50 a month. That was a good job in Ethiopia because people were so poor. And so labor costs fell 90%. But what then the meters started ticking because all the other costs were higher. And so the strategy of the, the amazing woman who got that firm to transfer and then made a success of the footwear industry in Ethiopia called uh, Helen Hay, she'd be worth interviewing at some stage. What Helen Hay managed to do, she realized the vital thing was to create a cluster as fast as possible. And how do you do that? Well, you don't do it by saying, oh, gosh, we're just hanging on, please come. You do it by bragging. Producing uh, trainers in Ethiopia is really, is really good business. And so I know Helen Hay because we were at the same conferences repeatedly around the world, her bragging about how wonderful her business was in Ethiopia. Uh, and it worked. Other firms came, and now they've got a cluster. But of course, at the moment, Ethiopia has plunged into the conflict trap. Indeed. And so got out of the landlocked trap by virtue of building a railway to the coast and this, creating this air hub, but it's plunged into the conflict trap. And that's a tragedy. The point you make about Addis being the hub is extremely important. And we've seen this already during the COVID crisis, how Chinese vaccines were transported to Latin America using Addis. And returning to the Malawi example, of course, now uh, South African ended up being in competition with Ethiopian. And Ethiopian was much more popular, I believe, you know, the flights from Addis to, to Lilongwe and to Blanta than the Joburg uh, Lilong way. Indeed, I've taken those flights, yeah. I, I once heard you say that while you were visiting Angola, I don't remember which year this was, you told the authorities that the best investment decision they could make was to buy two sets of airline tickets, one to Kuala Lumpur and the other to Lagos. And you apparently told them at that time they were booked on the plane to Lagos. Now, following your visit, apparently, this is your story, they apparently invited the government of Malaysia to provide them with advice. We don't think, of course, Angola has made the kind of progress that they should have made. So um, what I'm trying to get at is in terms of, say, natural resource governance to go right, what is the advice you have? Is it about learning from others? Because the Nigerias and the Angolas haven't done very well. Some are debunking, of course, the resource curse thesis, saying that's inadequate. 
We should be talking more about uh, economic diversification. What are your thoughts there when you think about your trip to Angola and the kind of advice you gave the Angolan government? Yeah, the um, the advice on, for Angola was was on two different things. One was natural resource management, and um, but the other was about urbanization. Lagos at the time was an example of a of a mega city that didn't work very well. Whereas Kuala Lumpur was a city which, which worked a lot better. And, and unfortunately, Angola has still not really made a success of urbanization. It's, it is urbanizing very fast. I'm now working a bit with the, with the Chinese authorities here because there's a huge influence of China in Africa, huge influence. But it's not actually been anything like as helpful as it could have been because if we look at the process of urbanization, China is about as good as it gets in a uh, transition from a, a low-income country to a middle-income country without the cities collapsing into congested mega slums. Chinese cities are far from perfect. They made mistakes, but they did manage to keep the settlement ahead of, sorry, to keep the the growth of the, the physical infrastructure and the housing ahead of the flow of settlement. And in, in Africa, that hasn't happened. In Rwanda, it hasn't happened. And so that was part of my message, was to try and learn from, from the Chinese on urbanization. And the tragedy has been that the Chinese, who know a lot about urbanization, have not transferred any of that learning into Africa. And that's a great shame. On the, on the, going back up to the issue of natural resource management, Angola actually has cleaned up its act a bit. And that's because the former president tried to pass power to his family. And this is a feature that's really quite common. Zuma tried exactly the same thing in South Africa. So Zuma wanted to pass power to his former wife, in uh, Angola, the president tried to have, pass power to his daughter. And of course, Mugabe in, in Zimbabwe also tried to pass power basically to his wife. And in, in all three of these situations, what happened was the political party, the ruling party, realized that it wasn't in their interest to keep power in the family. It was in their interest to keep power in the party. And so, in each case, the ruling party ousted the chosen successor of the president. And that's led in Angola to something of a cleanup of the, of the abuse of natural resource revenues. Far from perfect, but a big improvement. So that's an, it's been a, a fascinating power struggle in which overpowerful presidents tried to keep it in the family and that produced a tension of a battle between the political party and the family. And in each case, the presidents narrowly lost. You've also written this wonderful book from 2010 called The Plundered Planet. And I think you mentioned two types of plunder. One is the few stealing the property of the many, that is looting that takes place in many countries. And another type of plunder has to do with the rights of future generations. And while reading that book again a few weeks ago, I was reminded of some of the discussions I've had with my youngest, August, he's 13 years. And actually, he's going to be one of my guests in season three of the show. We're going to talk about, you know, his ideas and thoughts for, for the future, very similar to the kind of discussions I believe you've had with your son, that the present generation's needs versus the needs of future generations and issues related to our custody of current assets, our responsibility to preserve the value of assets for the future. Now, earlier this year, I spoke with Grohal and Brundtlum, you know, the mother of sustainable development. When I asked her, you know, it, it's taken three decades for sustainable development to become mainstream. She said, well, it wasn't that long. If you think about you know, an idea or a new revolutionary idea, it took three decades, but it was worth the wait. But the question to you, Paul, is the sustainable development concept or the idea hasn't attracted that much attention in 
mainstream economics, has it? No, it hasn't. Mainstream economics is really a long way behind the intellectual frontiers now. First of all, I fully agree that three decades for a shift in ideas is not very long. And it's an unfinished business, as you imply, because this very influential profession, the economics profession, hasn't really woken up to the the idea of sustainability yet. It's just starting. And the, the cutting edge happens to be through the financial community, because the the big fund managers have realized that pension funds now want to put some of their money into what's called impact. And impact comes down to two concepts of social sustainability and environmental sustainability. And so the big investment funds like BlackRock, Goldman Sachs, they are now creating funds which claim to be environmentally sustainable. This is the battlefront of the next three years, and I'm very much engaged in it, is quite a lot of those so-called impact funds won't be for real. They will tick a few boxes and achieve what's called sustainability through very foolish rules. So one rule that's likely to become quite common is no investments in Africa. That would be disastrous for Africa if the big financial agencies like like BlackRock lure pension fund money into funds which just say we're not investing in Africa. That will leave Africa just to the Chinese, which would be disastrous. So that, over the next three years, the norms of what counts as an investment in sustainability will get set. That's the battlefront now, is, um, is, is that trying to establish practical, measurable norms of what counts. And, and there are sort of two dangers. One danger is that it will become bogus, it will become fraudulent. And we'll, uh, you know, it would be no surprise if some of the investment companies came up with things that claim to be environmentally sustainable but aren't. And the other danger is that we get rules which are short-sighted and foolish and appear to be, you know, appear to, uh, basically virtue signaling rules. Yes. Like a claim, we won't invest in any non-renewable energy. Well, we'll need non-renewable energy. We'll need oil for the next 50 years. It's no good pretending we won't. There just aren't the technologies there to enable us to, for example, to fly long-distance aircraft on, e- on electricity. We a long way from very light batteries, sufficiently light, to enable us to, to fly planes long distances uh, without stopping. I've been studying this, Paul, in terms of the embrace of this concept of sustainability. And it turns out that it's the private sector for the first time is showing genuine interest in development. They're talking about sustainable development, making all the right noises. But very few, in my view, very few are actually operationalizing that rhetoric. You know, there's, it's, it's much more about virtue signaling, gesturing, making all the right noises, but not necessarily showing the kind of follow up that they're doing. But I wanted to ask you something that is now being hotly debated. And throughout your work, of course, there's considerable focus. And you, you, you make the argument that economic growth is good for the poor. It's good for development. But in recent years, Paul, there's been this growing popularity of the degrowth movement. What are your thoughts about that? I think it's an indulgent fantasy of people whose lives are very comfortable. The idea that we should be preaching to Africa the virtue of continued poverty, let alone that we should try and impose on Africa continued poverty, it would be an ethical disgrace of the first order. Of course, poor countries have got to catch up with us. And of course, they need to catch up with us using technologies which are compatible with environmental sustainability. But here's a good question. Who should be producing 
the last barrel of oil ever produced on earth. Who should be producing the last barrel of oil or the, the last cubic meter of gas? Where should it be coming from? It seems to me, or, the, or for that matter, the last ton of coal. It seems to me perfectly evident that the, the last carbon-based resources should be extracted in the poorest countries so that they get the revenues. And instead, we're in danger of using our political and economic power over the poorest countries to make them close their, their carbon-based energy first. And that, to my mind, would be just shameful. It's an abuse of our economic and political power if we tell Africa it can't dig coal, whilst who is digging coal? Well, Sweden, Germany, America, Australia, these are all super rich countries merrily digging coal very fast. They're the ones that need to close their coal industries first. And so the idea that no, there should be no oil discoveries in Africa will just mean that the, the last barrel of oil comes from Saudi Arabia or Russia or Iran. And that doesn't seem to me either a geopolitically desirable outcome or a very ethically fair outcome. In response to that kind of a response, uh, Paul, I've heard the degrowth advocate saying, no, it is more about reducing consumption in our and richer parts of the world in our countries it is not as it is not so much about what poorer countries should be doing but we should be reducing consumption surely that is something that they may have a good point about oh, yes and we should be changing our consumption and of course we are you know my 20 year old is vegan and um and we ourselves have adopted we, we probably eat vegan or vegetarian about half the week and that that's uh, that's a very sensible response where each person can take some individual responsibility for these very low cost changes in lifestyle. It turns out that once you start eating vegetarian, it's really delicious. So the switch from a lower in, to a lower intake of, of, of meat, is, it makes sense. The switch to zero meat, to my mind, a bit too much virtue signaling. Chicken turns out to be a very, very high protein content. It's right up there with any other source of protein in terms of environmental inputs. And so you might, for religious reasons, not want to use chicken, but you can't justify not using chicken on environmental grounds. There are lots of things that we didn't get to talk about, among them the conflict trap. We haven't talked about aid. And I, you know, we briefly touched upon aid and, and your... Uh, critique of how aid is done and the kind of preaching. But one final issue I'd like you to reflect on, and that has to do with the global development agenda. Because in the bottom billion and in many subsequent books, such as The Plundered Planet, you are often very critical of these overarching developmental goals like the MDGs, the Millennium Development Goals. You argue that the MDGs actually lacked focus. These goals apply to too many countries rather than perhaps focusing more on the challenges of the poorest of the poor countries. But Paul, now we have 17 sustainable development goals, unlike the eight Millennium Development Goals. And this SDG, the 2030 agenda with the SDGs has now been widened not just apply to developing countries, but also the whole world. It applies to Britain, France, and Norway, so also rich countries. I would imagine this lack of focus in the SDGs must infuriate you. Well, I'm not very, uh, I think it's not very practical. I, I remember talking with a, a Finnish journalist about this a couple of years ago, and she was asking me about the SDGs. First, she didn't know what the S stood for, and, and secondly, I, I said, well, so how are they changing policy in Finland? And she looked at me completely baffled and said, well, of course they're not changing policy in Finland. In Finland, we set policy by election campaigns. And, you know, basically, we've got a democratic government that's trying to meet the, the, the concerns of, of voters. So I said, well, why do you think it should be different in Africa? In a way, it's a very artificial top-down thing measuring all this, you know, 161 targets and so on. I remember talking with the Chinese officials about it about a year ago. They, they said, well, 
No country has ever developed like that. Now it is important to change people's ideas on sustainability. And so getting a debate on these ideas is a good thing. Getting some quantitative indicators that actually we can judge firms by and countries by, that's not a bad thing. But this sort of top-down proliferation seems to me a bit, a bit unreal. I posed the question, what, what money will move as a result of the SDGs? And when I asked that question, the problem with the SDGs is that there's so many of them that everybody can justify what they're doing at the moment in terms of some SDG. It's SDG proofing everything. Yes. And so if everybody can justify what they're doing at the moment, according to we are furthering one of the SDGs, then really nothing's going to change. And that's the, 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 the sort of ultimate critique that we need things that are sufficiently targeted that things do have to change. So I think that you know, the campaign on eat less meat is a good one, but that's a much more focused thing where gradually ideas are shifting around the world. And again, it's not to be done, I think, by preaching. I think the, the tone of moral superiority adopted by some vegans is not helpful. Whereas the, the argument that actually we can all do our bit by eating less meat, that I think is helpful. And we need to have norms that are not dividing us into saints and sinners, but which all normal people can actually meet. Because most of us are in the end morally load-bearing. We're capable of thinking about concerns greater than just me now. Very few of us are capable of being saints. And so we don't need saints. We need these norms which most people can meet. And so most people are capable of being morally bearing. That's the wonderful message that comes from the latest research in evolutionary biology. We are hardwired, we've evolved to be unusually pro-social mammals. And that makes us capable of being morally load-bearing. It's always such a pleasure listening to you, Paul. Thanks so much for coming on my show today. Well, thanks very much for inviting me down. Thank you. And, and do continue your work in Norway. Your own migration has obviously been a very good thing. If you enjoyed this podcast, please spread the news among your friends and share it on social media. The Twitter handle for this podcast is Global Dev Pod. Thank you for listening to In Pursuit of Development with Professor Dan Bannock from the University of Oslo Center for Development and the Environment. Please email your questions, comments, and suggestions to inpursuitofdevelopment at gmail.com.